You know, we just finished praying. I want, I want to pray just one more time. Ask God to, breath, to bless the, uh, the study this morning. Father, would you just teach us now? And Lord, it's warm here in this barn, but would you keep our focus and our attention on you? Help us to hear what you have prepared for us to hear today. May we see things in, in the historical context. May we understand things better, even as we, as we talk about what's happening in the Middle East. Father, give us perspective. But more than that, Father, as we were singing the bridge this morning, that, that phrase, your grace uncompromising, just keeps coming back to mind. Your grace uncompromising. Lord, would you show us your uncompromising grace for each of us here. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who thinks that they're just not good enough to be involved with religion, they're absolutely right. None of us are. But it's not religion we want. It's a relationship with you, Lord Jesus. And it's a relationship that you bought on the cross. An opportunity for us, by your uncompromising grace, to step into a relationship with you, Father. That's why we're here. And I pray that if there's anyone who has been burdened with that sense of religion or religiosity or self-righteousness that would be removed this morning, that we could just come before you and hear from our Father. And Lord, if there's anyone here not in a relationship with you, I pray that it would happen today. Show us how, Father. And teach us your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, June 26th, an Israeli soldier was kidnapped by Palestinian terrorist group Hamas in Gaza on the southern border of Israel. June 27th, Israel responded with an incursion into Gaza, an incursion into Gaza and unconditional re- demands for the release of that kidnapped soldier. July 4th, Israel refuses a Hamas set deadline for the release of Palestinian prisoners resulting in terrorists launching rockets into Israel. July 5th, Israel launched further incursions into Gaza in response to the rockets fired. July 11th, Israel began attacks in southern Gaza despite criticism from world leaders. The U.S. stands up behind Israel. I thought it was great. July 12th, two soldiers were then abducted by Hezbollah, the terrorist group based in the south of Lebanon on Israel's southern border. Israel responded to the northern kidnappings with maneuvers against Hezbollah. July 13th, Israel, Israeli forces began bombing key sites in Beirut, Lebanon. The U.S. warned its citizens to get out. As you've been watching, that's been a very difficult thing to just get out of that area. July 15th, the U.S. weighed in, blaming Syria and Iran for the terrorist attacks of Hezbollah and Hamas. July 16th, Hezbollah rockets blast the northern coastal town of Haifa. Further into Israel than any uh, rocket fired to date, Israel continued pounding away at Hezbollah, taking out infrastructure and transportation in Beirut, blockading the port cities of Lebanon. July 17th, Hezbollah rockets land in the Israeli resort city of Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. July 19th, Hezbollah rockets reach as far as the city of Nazareth in Israel, killing two Arab Israelis. July 20th, Israeli fighting continued against both Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south. As of today, Condoleezza Rice is heading over to Israel and to uh, talk with, with leaders in the region to see if she can get some consensus and some help there. And on Thursday, as I was sitting eating lunch with my son Hayden, he asked what was going on. I've had the news running pretty much 24-7 when I walk into the living room just to check and see what's going on in the Middle East to see what's happening. I know many of you have signed up for a trip to Israel next March. I'm still going. You can decide if you want to go or not. <laughs> um, no, I, at this point, I would just say don't worry about it. That's next March. A lot of things can happen between now and March, so we're just watching what's going on. But we're watching what's happening in Israel. It's a whole lot more important than just a possible cancellation of a trip. There's so much more at stake here that's going on in Israel at this time. And as I was trying to explain this to Hayden, he's nine years old, and he was sitting there asking, what is all the fighting about, what's going on? And I tried to give the best explanation I could, and Hayden, after listening to my words and watching the news for a minute, just looked up at me and said, Dad, these, these guys need a time out. <laughs> and that's exactly what I said. That's exactly what they need. Everybody needs to take a time out. Although, I, I will say this, I don't believe a ceasefire is, is called for in this situation. Um, I think terrorism needs to be taken out. But Hayden asked, Dad, why are these people fighting Israel? 
what's going on. That, that list of, uh, of a timeline that I just gave you beginning back in June 26 sounds like something you could read out of history, out of 1948, the day after Israel became a nation and they, they fought their first war. And have been fighting ever since. While we sit comfortably in America up until 2001, uh, there are a few things that shook us up, but most of what happened happened outside of our borders. We have not been a people used to fighting terrorism. Israel has always fought terrorism, at least the current Israeli nation. From day one, they have had to learn to plow, to work, to live with an Uzi strapped to their backs. Every single Israeli citizen, when they turn 18, when they graduate high school, has a responsibility of two years in the military. Every one, male, female, they all do. Which creates an incredible sense of unity in that country, especially when a soldier is kidnapped. You see why the country was so upset and responded so immediately. Because everybody in the country is an Israeli soldier, or has been. And so there's a, a tremendous sense of support for their military. They have fought terrorism from day one. Why? Why has this happened? Why does it continue? Can we find some answers, some solutions for this? Last week we talked about conflict. We saw all the way back when the children of Israel were about to cross into the promised land that they were going to come up against their brothers, their distant brothers, the people of Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau were brothers and Jacob became Israel, so Esau and his descendants are the brothers of Israel. And God said, be careful when you go in. Now don't get in their face because they're afraid of you. This is a tender situation. Just go around them. And we talked last Sunday in a practical way about conflict. How do we deal with conflict in our lives? How do we handle conflict in our relationships based on how the Lord led the people around these landmines, if you will, of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites? Well, this morning I want to look at the same idea from a prophetic point of view. A prophetic look at conflict. A prophecy update, if you will. We have these from time to time to try and understand what's happening in the world, how it applies to Scripture, or vice versa, what the Scripture tells us about what's going on. Last week we read this verse. I'll read it to you again. Psalm 83, verse 4. tells us they have said, Come and let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. That could be lifted right out of the charter of Hezbollah and Hamas. Let us wipe them out as a nation. That's the intention, to drive the Jews into the sea. That's behind the terrorism. And the psalmist wrote it so long ago. Verse 5 of Psalm 83 says, For they have conspired together with one mind. Against you, Lord, they make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Jabal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Tyre just entered the news this morning, by the way. They were struck um, by Israeli horses. Tyre, interesting. Assyria has also joined with them. They have become a help to the children of Lot. Now, I said this last week. I just want you to be up to speed on this. That Edom and Ishmael, being the forefathers of the Arab world, would include Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Iraq, Kuwait, Qatar, and Yemen. The Arabic people draw their roots back to Edom and Ishmael. These other names, Jabal, Ammon, and Amalek, would be modern-day Jordan today. Uh, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre, would be modern Lebanon. Inhabitants of Tyre. By the way, it's interesting that the psalmist writes the inhabitants of Tyre. That that phrase, it's, it's different than the rest. The rest is talking about the peoples, but in this case he says the inhabitants of Tyre. And we can see maybe a connection there because Hezbollah are, not the, are the inhabitants of Lebanon. Not being Lebanese for the most part themselves, Hezbollah are inhabitants of Lebanon, working out of Lebanon against Israel. The psalmist writes about Assyria, that'd be modern day Syria, and Persia is modern day Iran. And the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 35 verse 5 says, You have had everlasting enmity and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity and at the time of the punishment of the end. So I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 this morning and see what Moses had to say about our current conflict going on in the Middle East today, July the 23rd, 2006. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning in verse 25. Let's start in verse 24. Deuteronomy 4.24 For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and, and act corruptly, Moses speaking to Israel, and make an 
idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you out. There you will serve gods in the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. I might add, but they sing. Verse 29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. Verse 31, For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Indeed, ask now concerning the former days which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything been done like this great thing? Or has anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard it and survived? Or has a God tried to go to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, and by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm and by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you, verse 35, it was shown that you might know the Lord. He is God. There is no other beside him. Israel, in the latter days, you're going to return to the Lord. Moses said, so long ago, in the latter days, that phrase, the latter days, in Hebrew, it's Yom Akari. Yom Akari. It literally would be translated not latter days, but last days. In the last days, and how amazingly timely this passage is for us today. As we watch world events unfold. For truly, to understand what's going on in the world, the best place to turn is not the Seattle Times. If you want to understand what's going on, it's not the Washington Post or the New York Times. It's not Hannity and Combs or Tucker Carlson or Rita Cosby. She just bugs me, by the way. I don't know about you. I, I don't know if you watch MSNBC, MSNBC but she just, yeah. So my big boy, she's not. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lord, I know you create. I, I apologize. She's your daughter. I hope she knows you. It's the Bible. This is where we go to understand what's going on in the world today. Not just where we go to find out, oh, that ancient history, 3,500 years ago, that dusty old time back where, you know, all those weird peoples and different groups were living that we don't really relate to. We don't understand. It has no impact on us today. The Middle East, no Israel, no Jerusalem. In fact, the Temple Mount is at the center of everything going on in the Middle East right now. That one spot on the map, if not for the conflict over that piece of property, there would be no issue if it weren't about that. And so Israel has been in conflict from its beginning. Chuck Missler calls it the times of the signs. And things are happening at breathtaking pace right now as we watch. But the Bible gang, I remind you, is our greatest source for information about what's happening and about what will happen. That's why we have this book that we might know. And that we might be able to live in this world at this time, understanding what the Lord is calling us to do. In our very text this morning, 3,500 years ago, Moses spoke in no uncertain terms of the future of Israel all the way up to the Yom Akari, the last days. And we are seeing in our days this fulfillment and the fulfillment of many other biblical prophecies. Go back to verse 25. I'm going to walk this through this morning and see if we can apply it and understand it in the context of Israel today. Back at verse 25. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger. Now understand, the people of Israel did remain long in the land, as it's declared in verse 25. In fact, there's been a Jewish presence there continually for 3,500 years. There has never been a time where Israel has not had Jews. 
There are specific sites throughout the landscape, cities that you can visit and see that have always been Jewish communities within the land of Israel. But even before they were cast out as a nation, they lived there a long time. But after some 700 years, once they cross over the Jordan, settle in the land, and the kingdom begins to grow and the people begin to uh, spread out, after 700 years, exactly as Moses prophesied, the people's rebellion provoked the Lord. 732 B.C., northern Israel fell to the Assyrians, again, today's Assyrians. The Assyrians brutalized the people, dragging them across the desert, pulling them out of their homeland, northern Israel. That is the ten tribes that were in the north at that time. 732 B.C., it was a brutal time. The, the, the Assyrians were known to put fish hooks in the mouths of their prisoners to drag them along. And so the northern tribes of Israel fell. In 586 B.C., southern Israel, or Judah, fell to the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. And the first Jewish temple, Solomon's temple, was raised to the ground on the 9th of Av. Av is a Jewish month that is similar to our August. It's around that time of year. The 9th of Oz. Uh, of Av. Not Oz. <laughs> That's a different town. <laughs> Seventy years later, God began to stir in the Jewish heart once again, and they sought and received permission to return to their land. Under Persian rule, they began to rebuild, and a second temple eventually was built. 400 years they struggled there in conflict with this nation and that nation until finally, well, the Jewish people rejected Jesus as their Savior. You see, God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Something happened in Israel. They had come back from captivity. And Jesus comes on the scene 400 years later, but he was rejected. And so Jesus declared the following about their rejection. Before he died in Luke 1941, he approached Jerusalem. He saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day before you the things which make for peace, but now they have become hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And that's what happened in 70 A.D. when Rome surrounded on every side the city of Jerusalem and literally flattened it. That's the history of Jerusalem, by the way. And if you get the chance, if we have opportunity to go there, then what we will see is archaeology is stunning there because every time Jerusalem was wiped out, they just flattened the city and built right on top of it. And then someone else would come along and flatten it and build right on top of it. Thirty-five times in history that are known of, Jerusalem was flattened and built upon. And so there are layers of history in that city. It's a fascinating, fascinating place. But Titus, the Roman general, sacked Jerusalem. He destroyed the second temple. Interestingly, it was also on the 9th of Av, same exact day that the first temple had been destroyed. And so Jews today will celebrate Tisha B'Av, which is that celebration, that looking back to the destruction of the temples. Well, at that time in 70 AD and following, the Jews were driven out in mass, and they were chased out to places like Masada another landmark in the uh, country of Israel. In AD 773, there was a mass suicide at Masada. It was a stronghold that many of the Jews fled out of Israel and went to. There were about a thousand zealots up on Masada, and it was almost impenetrable. In fact, they had a storehouse of food in Masada that would last them five years. The Romans surrounded Masada with siege, uh, just siege ramps coming up, and, and they were all around. And from their vantage point in at Masada, you can even see today the remnants of those Roman uh, garrisons, I guess, that were down on the ground. You can see the outlines of where they were surrounding Masada. Up on Masada, a mass suicide occurred. Actually, it wasn't really a suicide. It was for one person out of a thousand. What do you mean by that? Well, what happened was the Jews were up on top of Masada, knowing they had storehouses with five years' worth of supplies. They could have held out that long. And the Romans were building a siege ramp to get up to Masada. You can see the remnants of that. And as they were building, all the Jewish people had to do up on the top was throw rocks down on them 
and keep them from building the siege ramp. But they didn't do it. They allowed the ramp to be built. Why? Because those who were building the ramp were Israeli slaves or Israelite slaves. And so to stop the building of the siege ramp, they would have to kill their own brothers. And they wouldn't do it. And so on the night before the siege ramp was to be completed, the leaders met in the synagogue there in the, in the place that they used for temple on Masada. And they reached an agreement. Because it's offensive to God for a Jew to commit suicide, they reached an agreement that each man would kill another. All the way down, they drew lots until they got down to the last man. And the one who had the last lot would be the last one standing, and he would have to commit suicide. They would rather die than fall to Rome. The next morning, when Rome broke through and came up onto the top of Masada, it was an eerie silence. And they found scattered throughout the lives of husbands and wives and children all dead by the sword. They left the storehouses full that Rome might understand they could have survived for five years. Conflict. In 135 AD, after all of the mess of 70 AD and then 73 and, and all the driving out of the Jews, there was a Jewish uprising called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And in this revolt, the emperor, Roman emperor, emperor Hadrian absolutely sacked Jerusalem again. This time driving out the Jews, this time salting the land so that no, no produce could be grown. Absolutely just destroying the land at the time. He renamed Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina, that is the capital of Hadrian. After renaming that, he renamed the entire country of Israel. He called it Palestinia, Palestine. It means Philistine land. The Roman emperor Hadrian named it after the arch enemies of Israel in the past as a slap to the face, Philistine land. And that's where Palestine comes from, though the Palestinian people today will say that they draw back to the Philistines. They don't. It was a Roman emperor who gave name to the land at that time. Well, look at verse 26. It says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it but will be utterly scattered. Verse 27 says, The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you out. And there you will serve God, the work of man's hands, wood and stone, and neither see, neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. And so from that point forward, from over 1,800 years, the Jewish people lived a life scattered throughout all of the world, scattered in all the nations, into Europe, China, India, Russia, Ethiopia, wandering Jews, the diaspora, dispersed throughout the nations. And then verse 29 tells us, but from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. Listen, gang, no ethnic group has ever survived more than three generations without a homeland. No other group but the Jews did. They somehow survived over 1,800 years. We even ask the question, where are the Hittites today? Where are the Canaanites? Where are the Megabites? They're not in existence anymore. They're gone. The flashlights. And the termites. And Anyway. But there's more to this amazing story. Listen to this. And it fascinates me. For in 1894, a French Jew... A man by the name of Alfred Dreyfus was falsely accused and convicted of treason and espionage by the French. They said that this Alfred Dreyfus was selling secrets to Germany even though he was not even in France at the time that this happened. They, they blamed him. He became a scapegoat. But rather than support him in this obvious injustice, the people of Paris, back in 1894, flooded the streets and began to call for his execution. In fact, they began crying out, death to the Jews, death to the Jews, shaking their fists in the sky, death, death to the Jews. And a young Jewish supporter was there on the streets of Paris at that time, watching all of this take place, and he realized there was no safe place for the Jews in the world anymore. He looked around and he saw this attitude of his fellow Frenchmen, and he realized they would never be safe until they could get a national homeland. This young Jewish reporter, his name was Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl. And in 1897, in Basel, Switzerland, Herzl mapped out plans for a state of Zion. 
It's the first Zionist conference. That's where the Zionist stuff comes from when you hear, you know, the, the Arabs especially talking about the Zionists. We've got to stop the Zionists. And that draws all the way back to Herzl. He mapped out plans for a Jewish homeland. And the vision caught on, and gang, Jews began to make their way back there. Even without it being their country, they began to go back into Palestine and buy up plots of land. Mosquito, malaria infested land, bogs, the wastelands, the rocky wastelands in the south. It was an absolute mess. In fact, Mark Twain is quoted in his book, Innocence Abroad. He called Palestine the most God forsaken place on the face of the earth. When you read about in the Psalms or in some of the early writings in the Old Testament about the beauty of Israel, and at least in Mark Twain's day, people would go and it was just a barren wasteland. That's still in the psyche of people today. That's still what people assume when they think about Israel. It's just a vast wasteland of desert. It's not. The Galilee is one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited on the face of the earth. It's absolutely stunning what has happened in the last 50 years there especially. But the Jewish people, because they began buying up all these plots of land and working the land as best they could, they bought it all up. They're the only nation in the world that actually can produce title deeds for the land on which they live. We can't do it. Americans can't. We came into America, our European ancestors, and we just fought our way across, across the country and took it over. We don't have title deeds proving that we purchased this land. We're here because we took it by force. The Israelis bought their land piece by piece by piece. At the same time, another piece of the puzzle slipped into place. A man by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda, a passionate student of the Hebrew language, he had in Hebrew read the entire Torah, the Mishnah, and the Talmud by age 12 in Hebrew. And he decided, after taking his wife and 11 kids and moving back to Palestine, he decided that they were no longer going to speak anything but Hebrew in their household. He stood before his family one evening in their new little home there in Palestine and said, Kids, this is the last sentence you're going to hear me speak in English. And from that point forward, all he would speak and all he would allow spoken in his home was Hebrew. It was at that time a dead language. Kind of like Latin today. It was a language for scholars, but it was not a spoken language at the time. And if you travel with us today, you'll find, or in, in March, you'll find on Ben Yehuda Street, a street named after him, because, because he was the one used to resurrect a dead language. Because Hebrew is now the language of Israel. And it all started with Ben Yehuda. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, tells us the following. The Lord says, For then I will turn to the people a pure language, and they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. In those last days, I'm going to restore a language, a pure language to the people. Now, I can't prove this. This is just my, my guesswork, my surmise. But people ask, what do you think is the oldest language or the first language on earth? And I would submit to you that I think it's Hebrew. I think it's the first one. I can't prove that, and I could be wrong. It's just me. But it is interesting that the Lord has now reproduced, again, this language of Hebrew. The Hebrew poet, Chaim Islach, said that language is the key to a nation's heart. And so Jews began buying up the land. They began speaking in Hebrew again. They all came back into land, and it started to flourish. But around that same time, or just after that, a man rose to power in Germany by the name of Adolf Hitler. And the Holocaust of World War II brought about the massacre of 6 million Jews. Although there are those today who would deny that. Is he trying to get in again? But we can talk later. Goodbye. Stick with me here. This is important. I'm not just doing a history lesson. This has a point. <laughs> when the dust settled from the horrific affair of the slaughter, the massacre of those six million Jews, the United Nations, in a rare moment of sympathy, by a one-vote majority, granted Israel a national homeland. As world sympathy turned just for a moment, Theodore Herzl's Zion was born. Isaiah chapter 66, and if you want to turn there, you can. I'll read this to you. Isaiah 66, verse 7. Isaiah 66, verse 7. Isaiah, 750 years before Jesus. So 2,700 years ago said the following. Before she travailed, 
she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. Shall I bring to the point of of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I, who gives delivery, shut the womb, says your God? Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her, all you who love her. This happened. A nation was born in a day. Nothing like it has ever happened in history. 1948, May 14th. On that day, Israel was declared a nation again. The nation of Israel. And on May 15th, 1948, their first war began, the War of Independence. A conflict began and hasn't stopped for the people of Israel since then. I meant to read a little further. Isaiah 66 again. Verse 10 says the following, Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her, all you love who you who love her. Be exceedingly glad with her, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied with her comforting breasts, that you may suck and be delighted with her bountiful bosom. For the, thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river. And the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed. And you will be, I love this picture, you will be carried on the hip and fondled on the knees. Have you ever seen a mother with child? We have many here. Watch today as we finish up and, and they're walking around holding that little one on their hip. Safe and protected. Verse 13, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Now back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's a beautiful promise to a people in conflict, a people who have only known conflict for the entire existence of their nation. It's an indication of the heart of God and the nature of God. Don't miss that. Let's step out of history just for a second and understand the nature and heart of God to you and to me. Is one of compassion. It's one of love. It's one of a desire for relationship. Well, verse 30 in Deuteronomy chapter 4 going on says, When you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you, in the last days, Yom Akari, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to His voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which He swore to them. God is a compassionate God. Do you know this to be true? Perhaps the weight of the world rests on your shoulders or sits heavy on you. Perhaps you have viewed God as one who is harsh and judgmental and punitive. One who expects you to live up to a certain standard. And if you don't reach that standard, you fall out of his will and you have no hope or no choice. There are so many people today who don't even give Christianity a chance because of that faulty view of God. Why would I want to be involved with religion and church? Well, I'll tell you, I don't want to be involved with religion and church. I'm a pastor, but I'm not religious. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, who is a compassionate God. The God of the Bible is not toying with us from on high. He's not playing with us as little little toys, as little instruments of His pleasure, just having fun with us, making life hard when He wants to. That's not God. Our God is a compassionate, compassionate God. Verse 32 going on says, Indeed, ask now before, or concerning the former days which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth and inquired from one end of the heavens to the others, has anything been done like this great thing, or has anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire, as you have heard it, and survived? Napoleon Bonaparte was once asked, or once asked his second in command the following question. He said, what proof is there, if any, that the God of the Bible is true? And his second in command wisely responded, the Jew, sir, the Jew. You want proof of this book? All you need to do is look at the history of the Jewish people. And the history of a God who says, I will keep you alive. You will survive against all into the land after 1800 years of being scattered all over the nation. You do have a place, a homeland. I will bring you back there. And ultimately, says the Lord, I will restore you. And I will keep every promise to you I ever made. God's relationship with and preservation of the Jewish people is a powerful witness 
that he will do exactly what he says he's going to do. In verse 34, Moses says, Has a God tried to go and take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials and signs and wonders and war and by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Now listen, watch this. Verse 35. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is no other beside Him. That's the point. The point of looking at Israel, of considering things from a prophetic viewpoint, and seeing how these things have laid out over history biblically, is to understand this point. It's not so that you can recount dates, or names, or places. It's so that you might know the Lord. That you might know the Lord is God. He chose Israel out so that he could walk in an example with a people that the rest of humanity, the rest of us, could watch and see that he is a loving God, a compassionate God, that he is a father, and that he follows through even in times that are impossible. Gang, it's in knowing the Lord that we find calm in our conflict. It's in knowing the Lord that you have peace in your problems that you can find rest in the uncertainty of life. Thursday morning we were praying for Eric regarding the deployment to Iraq. And Eric was just talking about his heart. This is what amazed me. I'm just going to dote on you for a minute, Eric. Sorry. You had to come this morning. But you get His concern as we prayed was for his wife, Debbie, who's going to be here. We have a responsibility to the wives of our Navy guys and and spouses of our Navy personnel. We prayed for Debbie, we prayed for Eric for protection there, for him, for her. But then he went on to really pour out his heart. And his heart is those around him that they might know the Lord. And that so impressed me. Here's a young man going into battle in Iraq. And his heart was, I hope while I'm there that I have enough of a relationship with the Lord that I can talk about it. That people might come to know him. That they might have that same hope, that same assurance that I have. And Eric, I want to say to you, it's not based on your knowledge. You know that. It will not be based on how long you've been a Christian or how many verses you can spew out. It will not. It's it's your relationship. It's the fact that any of us know the Lord. It's knowing the Lord that makes the difference in our relationships in this world. It gives us opportunity to talk about Jesus. Not our wisdom. It's not our schooling. It's not a that. John chapter 20, verse 31. John said, these things were written, this book. It was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may become really religious people. (laughs) No, that by believing, you may have life in His name. And not just any old life. John says in 1 John 5.11, the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Does that sound like a distant God to you? This life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And these things, John said, I've written to you, that you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. A life that doesn't end. A life that has no fear of the threats of what's going on in the world today. No concern for that. No worries. I had another friend, Mike. Mike, are you here this morning? Mike Rice here? There you are. Oh, back getting water. Good for you. All right. Mike stopped by on Thursday or Friday morning. It was this week sometime. It's summer. Mike, and in the summer, I'm just like, what day is it? I don't know. Mike stopped by this weekend, we were talking, and he asked a question about um, life support. The question of life support, should someone, you know, and extreme measures or extraordinary measures to save a life, you know, when you, you get to that point where you have to sign a piece of paper in the hospital, if something bad happens during the surgery, I want extraordinary measures to save my life. Should a Christian do that or not? We had a very interesting conversation about this, but you know what? I'll tell you this about a Christian in that situation or any situation, we have eternal life. And I'm not telling you whether or not you should choose life support. I mean, that, that's, you know, your life circumstances. You need to make that decision. But I will tell you this. You have life. You have life in the sun. And death is a non-issue. It doesn't matter. And I'm walking in relationship with Jesus Christ. And I will continue walking in relationship with him. Even if as, I, as I'm walking out of the barn, a bird dive bombs me, hits me in the head just the right way, and I fall dead. 
granted, that'd be a little weird. <laughs> but if that's how I go, hey, wonderful. I have eternal life with the Son. Don't you want to know that you have life eternal? Listen, Israel as a nation has yet to discover this. They are back in the land. They are flooding back into the land. But it's a secular return right now. It is not a relationship return. They have not come to that point that they understand the relationship with God found in and through Jesus Christ. But they will. They will. God is not through with the Jew. The Bible is clear about this. But he's not through with you either. He has a heart for you. Listen, the prophecy of Moses that we've looked at this morning declares that we will see these things happening with Israel, Yom Akari, in the last days. And there are plenty of other passages, I don't have time this morning, that we can go to to look at what the Bible says about what will be happening in the last days. I've been asked many times, especially recently, do you think we're in the last days? <laughs> yeah. I absolutely think we're in the last days. Well, how much longer do we have? I'm not putting a date on it because the Lord didn't. But we know the time is short. We know we're living in the last days. If you do an application of what Scripture says and what's going on, well, just listen to this. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, the Lord says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who try to lift it will be severely injured. And all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. What is going on today? All the nations of the earth are gathered against or looking at Jerusalem and Israel. Exactly as the Lord said would come about. We are in the last days. In the timeline of conflict in the world, these are the Yom Akharif. So what are we supposed to do? How do we handle it? What, what do we do? For those of us who are not Jewish, what do we do? Luke chapter 21, verse 34, Jesus says the following. He says, be on your guard. <laughs> this is great. Listen, don't miss this. Be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down. He doesn't want you to be all stressed out in the last days. Freaking out. Oh no, that's another sign. That's another sign. This could be it. Oh, it's today's life. That's not what he wants. Have your eyes open. Be on your guard so that your heart will not be weighed down. And then he gives three things that weigh our hearts down. Dissipation and drunkenness. Those two go together. Dissipation is literally a hangover. I don't want your hearts to be weighed down with hangovers and drunkenness. You know, trying to deal with the pain of life by administering something that, that gets you through the day a little easier, that's just going to weigh you down. That is not the solution to dealing with conflict and the hard stuff in your own personal life today. Headaches and drunkenness. He says the other thing that weighs us down, he says, and the worries of life. Hmm. How many people are struggling with the worries of life? I just read that the young, uh, the young minister's wife who killed her husband, I forget the name now, but you remember the story very recent about this, this young woman who, who shot her husband, a, a pastor. And they're coming to find out that there were intense financial struggles going on. She was involved in a financial scam that was going to render them bankrupt. There's all kinds of stress going on there. And Jesus says, look, I don't want you to be weighed down with the worries of life. For if you are, he says, that day will come upon you suddenly like a trap. It will come upon all of those who dwell on the face of the earth. Dwell means settled in. Those of you who want to live the worldly life, it's going to come like a sudden trap. He says, keep alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And then he says this, and I'll end on this this morning. We've been very patient in this warm barn. Matthew 11:28. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As we watch the conflicts continue to stir in the Middle East, you know what Israel needs? They need rest. They need Sabbath. They need a break. They need a kingdom of perfect peace and righteousness where Jesus rules. But we, like them, in our lives, continue to get distracted. We continue to get stressed out by the worries. And Jesus would say, look, it's Yom Akarib. These are the last days. Live with joyful expectation. Don't live burdened and weighed down. Live looking up. 
because he's coming back and he wants to take you with him when he does.